When you look at the statistics, you can easily be fooled. They show us a rosy picture. The economy is booming, apparently, but let's have some courage to look at the real statistics, ones which don't sugarcoat the truth, ones which highlight the truth, statistics and indicators that smack you upside the head with truth. And that's why... You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we're going to look at several economic indicators. Some of these I've shown you before, but I want to squish them into one jam-packed episode. Let's begin with this. More than half of Americans will retire broke. On the left-hand side, 34% say they don't have retirement savings. 21% say they have less than $10,000. Now, this is fine for some people if they believe that they continuously make the income that they expect. So they have a job, perhaps, maybe it's a pension, maybe some sort of retirement account, and they're going to continuously get that money. But what happens if things change? How often in life does everything stay the same it's a constant and never-ending set of changes things happen things arise maybe it's a health issue maybe it's something with your spouse or with your child or a sibling or something occurs you never expected and that's when you have trouble you can't make ends meet so this is a big problem that I will constantly talk about, particularly with pensions, because we know how they have been cutting pension funds in the recent past. There are three points from this article out of the hill that I just want to touch on very quickly. The recoveries following the two recessions since 2000 have been far slower in pace than other recessions in the past. For most years in the last two decades, the typical household has seen no or very low income growth. People cannot make ends meet. I'm going to be showing you more examples of that. Income inequality also remains a persistent concern despite the recent income growth, not in real terms, of course. The bottom 40% of American households, those earning roughly $45,000 or less, received just 11% of the aggregate income in the U.S. economy today. And that number's been falling for 50 years. Basically trying to say that the average person gets less and less and less, and those at the very top get more and more. And the economic circumstances have not improved for many workers at the bottom end of the income distribution poverty rates today remain a full percentage point higher than they were in 1999 about one in five americans live in households with an income of less than 150 percent of the poverty threshold 36,000 for a family of four that's huge think about trying to survive on that speaking of poverty here according to pew research center since 2000 suburban Counties have experienced sharper increases in poverty than urban and rural counties. There are many people who are not doing well. It doesn't matter where you live, but this happens to highlight those in the urban and rural communities specifically. If the economy is so great, why are 78 million hustling for dimes? This here is talking about basically those side hustles or the gig economy, as many people call it. And I think that it's good to actually have something on the side to create an income source that's in addition to, let's say, if you had a nine to five job. It's always good to have multiple streams of income in case you lose one and also just to make some money in the things that you're passionate about or maybe that you are knowledgeable on. But it's not a good thing when you literally have to do this in order to make ends meet. And that's where I believe a lot of these 78 million people fit in. Almost half of US families can't afford basics like rent and food. Let me reread that. Half of US families, half of them, can't afford their rent and food. I'm not talking about iPhones and iPods and laptops and everything else. Although, yes, they're probably buying that. But they can't afford their food and rent. We've got a big problem on our hands and is not being addressed in the statistics of the CPI, the unemployment rates, and the uh, FANG stocks. doesn't show us the same truth that I'm bringing to you today. 
almost half of US families can't afford basic safe rent and food. This is basically covering the same issue where at the bottom, nearly 51 million households don't earn enough to afford a monthly budget that includes housing, food, childcare, healthcare, transportation, and a cell phone, according to this uh, issue here uh, brought to us by United Way Alice Project, 43% of households in the United States. Not in the labor force. When I look at the unemployment rate, you know, I used to go from rejecting it, then it was funny, but now I'm starting to look at it and, and becoming upset because it's getting more fake as time goes on. And I have people who are supposedly educated telling me that the unemployment rate is down and we should be happy. But anybody who has spent literally five minutes, less, two minutes, in looking into what the actual unemployment rate means knows that that number is not accurate and should not be shown to the public. I would be voting for the U6, at least the U6 number instead of the U3 number. It would give us a much more accurate depiction of the current labor market. But the unemployment rate is completely false because people get wiped off of it, even though they may still be unemployed. How ridiculous is that? Why would they ever do that? unless to manipulate the numbers. Not in the labor force. This is coming right out of FRED, which is the Fed. And they have these great charts on their site here. Not in the labor force shows us the numbers have continuously been rising. Continuously been rising, okay? It's not a little bit rising. It's not just for the past five years. More and more people are finding themselves out of work. And that's a fact. I understand that FANG stocks have been rising. I Trust me, I understand. Ratio of Social Security Trust Fund Reserves to Benefit Payments. Now, you have to understand what's happening here. Long time ago, the Social Security may have had money in it. Today, it doesn't have money in it. And so, people one day will not get their checks or they will be reduced to confetti. And that's the way it's going to have to work. They're going to be able to cut what they say they were going to dish out, but more people are going to have to put more tax money into it. So you're going to get double screwed over. You have to put more in, but then when it's your turn to get the money out, you're not going to get a dime. But they have a solution. And that is more taxes. That's right. Look at this example here. Union leader administration officials blast construction tax. We're looking at this out of Philly here. Despite criticism from some senior city officials and blistering opposition from the building trades unions, a proposed 1% tax on construction to fund affordable housing passed. What a ridiculous proposition. We have a problem here. Let's tax people. It's never going to solve anything. Oh, no, no. Just tax those people. No, no. Don't tax everybody. Just tax that group of people. Oh, or just tax those companies, or just tax those people. It, it doesn't work. It never works. There's never been a case in which a tax has ever worked, ever, to do anything. I'm tired of it. New risks are lurking in auto loans. I just covered this recently. I'll touch on it very quickly. As loan growth slows, banks and other lenders have been tinkering with loan terms in an effort to gain more consumers. They are originating greater share of loans with repayment periods of more than five years. In some cases, extending loans to consumers who are stretching further to afford their purchases. Banks such as TD, Santander, BB&T, and so on. Looking at these companies just as a small, small example of those who are going ahead and making their presence known in the field of risky business. That's what they're doing. Here's a chart for you, two charts actually. Long game for new cars, loans are longer, and monthly payments are becoming more expensive. So just stretch it out, stretch it out further. They've got less of a down payment. So that means the general payment becomes larger, and as a result, they are stretching it out further and further. That just means ultimately it's going to cost more because of the interest that they incur along the way. And of course, that interest rate is today, it's one rate, but tomorrow the people who are borrowing, trying to borrow, let's say a few years from now, will the interest rates be higher? Probably. 
they probably will. So they're not going to be able to necessarily afford those cars. So we could see that the automakers might be suffering as the years go on. Average monthly loan payments. Now looking at this, extending further as well. Shown you it, just the previous video, won't cover it anymore. Let me show you this last article. We're being pushed into a cashless society. This will allow the government, this will allow the technocrats to be able to manipulate and control all of the finances that take place. If you and I are doing business together, and I have this idea that I want to create something, whatever it is, some little widget, some product, maybe I want to do um, a little bit of work at your house and I want to construct something, maybe I want to do a little bit interlocking there, I want to do some landscaping, I want to be able to do things. Well, in doing so, they're going to be able to track all of those purchases and the transactions. And right now we have something called cash, which is used you know, it actually has an advantage in this way. It's not a good store of wealth, but it's great to transact between two people, okay? So I can give you money and uh, we will be able to exchange. You can give me money, I can give you money. This is a great way to do business. But now, cashless, they're gonna have to put those transactions through the banking system. And the banking system, of course, is very weak. We've seen the fragility, we've seen how many times it locks people out, we've seen people that have been, you know, uh, I wanna take $5,000 out of my bank. And then you ask 20 questions, oh, sorry, we don't have $5,000 right now, you have to come back in two days from now. This is the way it works, okay? We're being consistently shut down in terms of what we are capable of doing and the cashless society is really really ramping towards that and i've uh, looked into this as well you could see that uh, in sweden as an example they've really been going towards that this here talks about how they're trying to go away from it but the trend is already there there's almost no money left in cash at all so you know it, it might still be there 10 years from now but it's going to be basically not available you go into many stores today and they're all on ipads they don't have caches they all use uh, credit cards and things that's the way it's going whether we like it or not right i, I guess as a, a business owner it's good for you know you don't have to worry about anyone breaking in breaking in that you know that they won't have any money on hand i understand where it comes from there but of course at the same time they incur fees by doing this. Cash doesn't have any fees. So there's advantages on both sides of this, and I just wanted to bring that to you. That's all for this video. If you found it informative, please give me a thumbs up. When you give me a thumbs up, guess what? It helps to support this channel, so I do appreciate that very much. Now, if you went to school and every day they taught you financial education, you don't need these books. But if you're like one of the 99.9999% of people who went through school all the way from kindergarten through to college and beyond, whatever it might be, you didn't learn a single damn thing about your financial education. You have earning, you know, you're earning money here. You have no idea what to do with this. So what do we do? We go to the bank. We give our money to the financial advisor. He puts that in and everything is good during a bull market and during a bear market, he really pisses you off. So with these two books right here, you'll learn exactly what you need to know to be able to take your own finances under your own control and i think that is so important for people to do so what i did was i took all the knowledge that i had and i squeezed them into two books these two books right here between the two of them is going to cost you thirty dollars you'll learn more than everybody you know about how to manage your own money about the history of it all about what inflation really is about how to check into things for yourself so you don't need anybody else anymore but you could still go to your financial advisor and ask the right questions if you desire if you want to check these books out there are links in the description of this video if you want the audiobook format just head over to my site themoneygps.com click on that and you'll be able to see the audiobook format as well that's all take care